All right, well, welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm going to kind of start with a quick introduction of, you know, who I am and what we're doing here at Reviewer. And then we'll kind of come back a little bit and talk more about the kind of uh, agenda for today and the goals of today's conversation. Because I think, you know, kind of diving deeper into where we come from, what we do, and kind of our, our work with other alumni associations really speaks kind of broadly and sets the stage a little bit for kind of why we're doing today's topic. Um, I know we're going to end up posting this on our website, so hopefully I don't get in trouble for saying this, but I think, um, you know, alumni associations are probably one of, if not my favorite kind of demographic or type of clients that we work with. Um, so we work with hundreds and hundreds of, of different types of organizations from nonprofits to membership-based associations to corporations and really everybody in between. But the best part about alumni associations, as I kind of get deeper into my background, is everybody is so collaborative with one another. Um, you know, we've been a, a partner and, and a sponsor of the Council for um, Alumni Association Executives for, for a few years now. Um, and we probably work with give or take 30% of the membership. And um, I've been to numerous kind of conferences and, and some of the institute meetings. And um, very few conferences and, and these types of events I've attended um, have I seen so many people get into a room together and kind of hash out best practices and really try to help one another, um, which makes total sense, right? Uh, from an alumni association perspective, they're your alumni, you're not competing with other institutions. And so sharing best practices and insights and feedback is something that you just commonly do. So um, the reason why I want to bring all that up, so kind of my quick introduction, you know, my name is Kyle, I'm the CEO here at Reviewer. Um, been doing this now since day one back in 2012. And um, you know, we actually built Reviewer uh, from our own kind of hands-on experience. We kind of walked in your shoes and lived in your life. Um, so we were part of the volunteer review committees for what I call funding opportunities, but very similar to your alumni awards, scholarships, grants, board nominations, and things like that. And so, excuse me, when I say we kind of walked uh, in your shoes, I mean that we were the ones who had hundreds and hundreds of binders being mailed to us. We were tasked with handwriting notes and feedback and scores and sharing um, the results back. We'd meet with other committee members. We'd hash it out. We'd pick our, our uh, award recipients. And over time, we started to see kind of that online transition. And what I really mean by that is we started to see the uh, implementation of uh, built-in web tools, um, you know, Qualtrics, built-in survey tools, forms, emails, spreadsheets, lots and lots of spreadsheets. Um, you know, going to Google Drive and downloading things. And we saw the many negative ramifications that came with it. So what I mean by that is we saw, um, you know, information getting lost. So we'd have, you know, uh, programs where applicants would send in like an email with like an attachment of their nomination, their supporting documents, et cetera. Or they'd have um, award recipients or, or, or nominees submit additional deliverables to them through email, and they would go to either a spam filter or they would get lost. And Teams would sit down, they'd go through judging, they'd go through selection, and they wouldn't even review all the applicants or candidates. Um, you know, we started to see the process where it was very, very challenging to redact personal identifying information from an award nomination. And so, uh, unfortunately, review committees would sit down, they'd go through selection, and very clear personal biases would be uh, kind of put towards the applicants, whether or not they want to um, acknowledge it or not. And so, we saw very deserving applicants not receive recognition just because of personal biases. So, all of this came into play primarily because we're using a lot of tools and, and, and platforms in ways really unintended to try to execute the task at hand. And so because of that, again, we were part of those review committees. We built Reviewer as an online platform to run these types of campaigns literally from start to finish. And when I mean literally from start to finish the full life cycle, I mean the intake of nominations, the acceptance of nominations by the nominees, the uh, operational dashboarding, the communication tools, the workflows, and of course, the built-in judging selection process. And again, I, I mentioned I want to start with my introduction first before getting back into our agenda, um, because a lot of what we do here at Reviewer, obviously, from a platform perspective, will power these programs. It, it does exactly what I say it's going to do. It, there's a reason why it's the industry leader within this space to power these campaigns. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, because of our relationship with so many uh, of you guys and uh, alumni associations, not only have we seen a lot of really unique, powerful, incredible programs, we've also been able to identify kind of emerging trends and best practices and components that can kind of go into these campaigns. And as we go through kind of setup and launching of new clients or organizations, 
we like to take what you've either done historically and or what you want to do moving forward. We kind of work with you to load it into the system, but then we make some recommendations on kind of uh, core components and features that we have that you may not be aware of that would obviously serve you really, really well, but also kind of diving deep into our bag of other kind of clients and making maybe recommendations or insights and things that we're seeing. So the entire goal is to kind of bridge the gap between your background and, and your expertise as well as ours. So one of the common things that comes up in discussion around kind of an award program is like, what are the the uh, popular components and what's the right way to run a alumni award? Because again, if you think through uh, commonly how these campaigns are being ran, you're using your website, you know, you have your IT team toss a built-in web form on there, uh, nominations come in, hopefully uh, you download them, you export them, you put them into a folder, you put them into spreadsheets, you recompile it. You have to somehow come up with these committees and these teams. Somehow you have to share that very personal sensitive information to them, hopefully in a way that's you know safe and secure and compliant. Um, you know They're going to put together their thoughts, their comments, their notes, send it back to you. And it's a lot of moving parts. And so the goal today, I think, is to kind of take and dissect what I think is a very well-ran alumni award. In this case, it's the, the University of Georgia's um, 40 under 40. And some of the key components that they're leveraging, obviously, within reviewer, but just overarching kind of their philosophy behind it, um, that I think can kind of translate really well into really all uh, different alumni awards. Because um, I think at the end of the day, there's a couple different goals that we have to kind of talk through and discuss. So number one is operationally speaking, like there are so many uh, uh, hats that we wear within an alumni association. And my initial gut instinct is that, you know, playing around with emails and spreadsheets and merging data isn't the best use of your time. You should be focusing your time on doing what you do really, really well. And that's with engaging with your alumni, your stakeholders, your community, your student body, um, and leaving these to the experts. Number two, though, however, is that there are so many volunteers and people involved in these campaigns. We're all thriving and, and really trying to find ways to uh, build personal relationships with our alumni, with our nominees, with our board members, with our volunteers. Um, obviously, one of the biggest challenges that we have as an alumni association is building meaningful relationships with uh, kind of younger alumni and kind of getting them into your pipeline uh, long term. And so as much as we want to kind of roll up our sleeves and use these different types of tools that may not be the most efficient because we can, um, we need to kind of think through like we make up a very small fraction of the program and elevating the experience for the nominees and the review committees, et cetera, really should be at the forefront of, of kind of our, our goals. And so with all that said, I'm going to kind of run through, I think, some of the core components, I think, again, go really well into an alumni award. We'll visualize that with a real example as we go. Uh, and again, keep in mind that most of the alumni associations we work with are also doing board nominations, scholarships and grants and things like that. So uh, many of these components are relevant to those campaigns as well. But today we're going to focus primarily uh, on uh, the University of Georgia's 40 under 40. So. With all that said, let's kind of dive into the first discussion point. And I think this is, again, um, uh, uh, an emerging trend, something that we're seeing more and more of, um, but it's a very unique way of collecting nominations. So historically speaking, most alumni awards are kind of done with an open call for nominations and or a self nomination. And the challenge with that, um, more so on the open call for nominations, is that the nominator may not have all the information about the nominee, right? So many award programs are collecting things like resumes. Um, obviously, you want to know more about like your current uh, alumni jobs, their addresses, their contact information. So anytime that comes from somebody not the nominee or not the alumni, we have some risk around, you know, is it actually accurate or not? Um, not to throw myself under the bus, but if I was to nominate my wife for an award, not that I don't love her to death, she probably would write a much better nomination about me just because she's a better writer than I am and she might put forth different energy levels. And so is that a fair reflection on her as the nominee or is it so much more on me as the nominator, right? And so the challenge that we're running into is when we go to sit down and do a review and selection process, A, we're not even sure if the data is accurate. Um, B, we have to typically either reach out to the nominees, the alumni, or they're already working with the nominators themselves. Um, and then C, we're not really comparing apples to apples, right? Because some nominations are going to come in better written than others. Um, so those are some of the key challenges that we've started to see. So how do we combat that? And the simple answer to that is to break the process into two. 
So we start with an open call for nominations and or a self-nomination. And the goal there primarily should be to lower the barrier, right? We don't want the nominator to put forth a bunch of time and energy that they don't have. Um, and then number two is that we want to be use it as a marketing perspective. We want to get the word out there. We want to increase the potential number of engagements that we have. And the only way to do that is to increase the nomination pool. So the thought process here is that you do an open call for nominations. Again, who are you? Who are you nominating and why? And that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. From there, we treat these like the uh, like the Oscars or the Emmy Awards where the nominees or the alumni themselves will accept the nomination. And what I mean by that is they will then join kind of what was submitted about them. Now, you can totally keep it private and anonymous and not even show the alumni what was said about them but instead start to collect personal details about them by them. So who are they, their current job, their current address, all these really, really important things that you need to uh, enrich your alumni databases because we're always looking for current information. Um, it serves as a way to kind of build a one-to-one -one, uh, communication touch point with them, like automatically opting into newsletters, right? You're already kind of starting to build that engagement. Um, and then number two is that when you go to do a review and selection, not only can we ensure that the data is accurate, but we're comparing apples to apples. So whatever effort and energy was submitted came from them. So that's what's going to get reviewed. So that's kind of the main goal of breaking this process into two key components, nominations first, and then the nominees will then come in. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of walk through kind of what that would look like, because uh, operationally speaking, it can be quite challenging because, um, again, using historical methods, you might have all these nomination forms coming in. You now have all these nominees. How do you merge them together? How do you notify the nominees? How do you collect the information? Um, you know, if you are collecting file uploads, how are you doing that? Um, you know, you might be collecting references, which I absolutely love. If that is the case, like what does that process look like? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you kind of what the uh, University of Georgia is doing. And as I do that, I just mentioned references. I do want to kind of talk at a high level about that now so I can kind of show that to you at one time. So um, I personally love references. Again, um, how do you give your nominees a voice and differentiate themselves from one another? And so the reference letters are just another way to get a third party's perspective about the nominee. Um, again, thinking kind of bigger picture, most alumni associations doing uh, board nominations or scholarships, they're already doing references as well. The challenge with the reference, number one, is it's quite old school, right? Um, they're hard to write. You're being asked at the very, very last minute. Number two is you have to write a full-blown letter from scratch. Oftentimes, they're going to kind of regurgitate um, a template or something they've used previously. And much like the nominations, it's more of a reflection of the person writing the letter than it is the uh, person that it's about. So instead, let's lower the barrier for the reference. Uh, and to do so, we can actually send them like a notification. They would then come in and then ask them to fill out a reference template. And what I mean by that is like, what are the two to three things you want the references to talk about? That way, when you go to do a review, the data is extremely consistent, right? Every single nominee has the same data associated with them that the reference is answered. Um, maybe you do that in combination with like a reference score sheet. So like, what are your mission and vision? at the Alumni Association, what do you stand by? And ask the uh, reference to almost rank that candidate on those parameters. Again, utilizing that uh, instead of a reference letter. So again, uh, presented another challenge is that now as an Alumni Association, you've got nominations coming in and or nominees coming in and or references coming in. How on earth are you going to take all those moving pieces and compile them and centralize them into one spot? So again, don't worry, we got you covered. So diving into reviewer, um, I kind of jumped ahead just a little bit. Most of the alumni associations that we work with, and probably if not all of them, are using their main websites as the main marketing hub. So from a branding perspective and from a content perspective, you're going to use your website anyways. Um, we should be pushing traffic and leveraging your, your expertise. From there, most organizations will put a link that says click here to nominate or click here to apply. And then that link can do one of two different things. Either it can send them directly to what I call a microsite. So it's typically human nature to not read. So dates, deadlines, criteria. So it kind of serves as a middleman between your website and us. Or they send people to what I call like an account creation page, which I'm going to come back to. Um, as far as the nominations themselves go, again, I mentioned beforehand, the entire name of the game is to lower the barrier. So in this example, um, I put this here so I could show you the profile creation. However, um, I would not, however, have nominators create profiles. Again, we want to lower the barrier for them. Generally speaking, it's the alumni themselves as they join the nomination who creates a profile. But 
to talk more about this, the profiles are incredibly powerful and they're actually uh, probably essential to these programs because I already have mentioned all the moving parts that go into an alumni award. You got people, forms, file uploads, communication, scoring processes, ongoing data collection. And so the idea behind a profile is it holds on to all those moving pieces and all those components and centralizes them into one hub. So going back to our roots, you know, I loved the concept of a nomination packet or a binder. The challenge is I don't want to deal with physical heavy binders. And so what we're doing here is we're basically building a virtual binder or nomination packet about the nominee. So again, um, I wouldn't have nominators create one. It would just be the nominees. Um, but uh, just kind of visualize that. So moving on, this is, again, what a very, I think, well-structured nomination process looks like. Again, two main reasons here. Number one. Um, we're breaking the piece into two. So we have a nominator portion and then a nominee portion. And then number two is that we're significantly lowering the barrier for the nominators. So again, the goal is to increase our marketing efforts and increase volume. So nominators come in and they simply put in who they are. They're going to put in who they're nominating and then kind of a brief high level why. Why is that person deserving of this year's 40 under 40 or this year's you know Bulldog 100 or whatever your award program might be? And I do want to kind of pause there for a couple of reasons. Um, number one is if you're an alumni association with multiple awards, which many of you are, um, you know, you may have like your main alumni awards, your, your Hall of Fame, your uh, emerging alumni, your 30 under 30s, all these different types of use cases. What I would probably do is have a question that says, hey, what award is this for? And then from there, I'd also probably say, are you nominating somebody else or is this a self-application? And then based off of their answer, the system will kind of automatically update and guide them down the proper workflow. Um, the reason why I would ask them if it's a self-nomination or if they're nominating one of their peers is because at the end of the day, we want all the self-nominations to kind of come in the same way as if somebody was nominated and they're accepting their nomination. So again, um, kind of fine details that we're not going to get into today, but this is how I personally would structure a program. So in the uh, UGA 40 under 40 example, oh yeah, I want to go back to that. Um, 40 under 40, again, uh, this isn't a unique to an alumni association. This is uh, unique to uh, associations or membership-based groups in general, is uh, trying to target, attract, and retain and engage a younger demographic. So your, your recent graduates, those under the age of 40 is critical, right? Um, they're, they're the future of your membership, but they're also the hardest to engage with. So the pros of an alumni award is if you do a 40 under 40, you're actually segmenting and carving out a very particular campaign for that demographic. It gets them into your pipeline very, very early on. It gives you current contact and information about them to kind of get them into your uh, other types of campaigns that you might be doing, enriching your alumni database. But number two is it's typically a demographic of person that loves to partake in these campaigns, right? They, they love uh, the award concept. They love the 40 under 40. And so they're already going to be a higher participation rate than many other types of award categories. So again, kind of jumping over a little bit there, but nominator comes in, they submit their information. And then to kind of show you the power of a platform like reviewer is the nominator can kind of continue on, submit additional nominations, but then it triggers an email and it doesn't have to be automated. You could actually first vet all of the nominees and then trigger it later on. But the goal here is it's going to notify the nominees and say, hey, so-and-so, you've been nominated for this year's 40 under 40, click here to accept the nomination and complete your application. And that's then what will join them with the initial nomination that was filled out. So as you can see here, it looks like one kind of seamless experience, but it is very two dedicated workflows that automatically gets merged to one. So nominee or the alumni will then come in, um, you know, some type of welcome message, dates and deadlines, setting expectations, and then they get into the bulk of the application. So this is a perfect example and use case of why I think that this has to come from the nominee. So in this example, we're actually asking for information about them. We want to know more about kind of what school they graduated from. And then it seems like a super small detail, but we're asking for their current company they work at, their current address, their current contact information. That is absolutely like unreplaceable data. Um, we're, we are we absolutely need within our alumni databases up to date current records of our alumni. And there's no better way to do this than through awards. So right off the bat, we already have Ryan, our mate, our uh, made up uh, nominee, who's giving us current information. From here, Ryan or the nominee will progress onto the bulk of the application. Again, seems like a small thing, but we have to lower the barrier for them, and we have to have you know the option for them to save. They can log out. They can come back later. 
But the goal of this page is basically for them to tell us more about themselves, right? So tell us more about your career path, tell us more about your uh, uh, achievements as a, a, a Bulldog or a UGA alumni. Basically, the goal here is to create short answers or essays that align with your mission and vision at your unique alumni association. So this overarching kind of workflow, I think, can be uh, kind of templated and be used by any alumni association. But the actual individual content and the essay prompts are going to be unique to you and kind of what your mission and vision and what you stand for. Um, kind of one last thing to kind of talk about here, though, is from a marketing perspective. So any of the marketers on today's webinar are going to be kind of chomping at this from a, a conversion perspective, because right now we're able to track now, um, you know, the number of nominations that came in or those that have started and not finished. So you can send them built-in reminders. You can track and measure conversion rates on nominations that converted to nominees, but the nominee themselves never started. And then you can even go a step further and say nominator, nominee, and then nominees that actually started but haven't finished. And so at any step of the way, we can identify them. We can send them built-in reminder messages. That in itself typically increases participation rates within reviewer by like 30%. So really powerful things are happening. The next piece to this puzzle is going to be your references. So again, I mentioned beforehand um, kind of the component here. And again, I hate to see you reference letters. I would much rather see you reference templates. So in this example, the nominee just puts in the name and email of who is submitting a reference about them. It'll then trigger an email notification, in this case to Tony, that would say, hey, Tony, you've been asked to write a reference on behalf of Kyle. Click here to do so. Um, I'm going to show this to you here in a little bit. But again, Tony instead would then fill out a reference template. Um, and then the last piece before finally submitting our file uploads. So you can do a couple different things here. In this example, we're collecting resumes, we're collecting a photo for marketing purposes. Um, what you could also do is maybe you don't need photos from everybody. Maybe you just wait until the finalists or those that get selected, have them come back into reviewer and then submit their files later on. So it allows you to kind of uh, engage with people at different stages and collect different information based on the different workflows. So kind of moving on, we've collected uh, nominations, we've collected references, we've updated our alumni database, we've enriched it with updated information. I think this is the main piece of things I wanna talk about today is great, now that we've collected the nominations, what do we do with them? Because at the end of the day, they have to be sent out to a team for some type of review, judging and selection process. And this is where I think there's a lot of internal discussion around like, how do you wanna structure these programs? Um, what we have found over the years at Reviewer is on average, a volunteer specifically, but part of your review committee physically cannot review more than 15 people. And it seems like a very small number and it kind of is, but it makes total sense because they're volunteers. So if they sit down on a Wednesday evening after putting their kids to sleep and they're logging into a system like Reviewer to conduct a review and selection, they only have so much time and their energy falls off dramatically after 15. And so if they're reviewing 17, 18, 19, um, the applicants that they're reviewing, unfortunately, aren't gonna get the fair opportunity that they deserve just because the review committee doesn't have the energy at that point. And so there's a couple different moving things that we have to look at. So number one is we have to figure out like, how do we want to structure our program where we can take a bulk number of nominations and then assign it out to a team for review? So I would say the vast majority of the organizations that we work with will do it in combination of a couple different ways. Um, number one is they might have different committees for different types of awards. So if you have a 40 under 40, that has its own judging committee. If it's a... Um, Bulldog 100, in this case, they have another committee. If it's a, um, um, uh, we're trying to think of the word I'm looking for, um, a Hall of Fame award, they then have their own committee. So you're breaking it up by committees by award types. Um, number two is you could do phases of review. So you have an internal review where your internal team is just going thumbs up, thumbs down. They're vetting through people. They're using a high level score sheet. And then you advance the top X number to a phase two review that has a totally different committee totally different score sheet. The third way of doing this um, goes back to what I mentioned beforehand, where you have uh, about 15 submissions that the review team has the energy for, is you have to kind of survey and figure out what that energy threshold is, and then leverage automation and randomization. So you basically take all of your nominations, and then you equally and randomly distribute those out to your team for review. The major benefits behind that is two part. Number one is that you can control the number that they're gonna review. So you could literally say, don't allow a reviewer to score more than 15 people. 
but you're also removing any uh, potential uh, biases or uh, unfairness in the review process because you're using complete randomization about who's going to see what. We're going to come back to compliance here in just a second, um, but that's how I would structure this. The last piece of that puzzle as well is going to be public voting, and I'm going to come back to that more in, a, in, in more detail, um, but it's an emerging trend that we've started to see as one of those review workflows is actually a fan favorite or an alumni favorite. So again, what does that look like? Um, so coming into reviewer, I'm going to kind of jump ahead. You as a alumni association actually get these command centers, right? So it's like your command center that shows you days and deadlines, how many entries you have, uh, you know, the number of nominations that haven't yet been finished. Um, and allows you to kind of manage your, the entire life cycle of your award in one spot. Um, I do want to, however, visualize that profile concept for you, because again, I introduced a couple kind of challenges. One is how you manage nominations, nominees, and references together. So in Reviewer, you basically get this menu system, and that menu is going to be a listing of all of the nominees. From here, what you would simply do is click on their name and open them up. And again, you can filter and sort by their award category, their submission status, all sorts of parameters. But once you open them up, hopefully this helps you visualize what that profile concept looks like. So I have Leslie here. Leslie is one of our nominees. And Leslie now has her entire virtual nomination packet right in front of me. So in the center of my page is all of the content that we collected from Leslie when she accepted her nomination form. I can actually communicate one-to-one -one with her. So if I ever needed to send her direct emails or notifications or, or send her content, I can do it in Reviewer. I can leave internal notes about my nominees. This is like a, a way for you and your team to collaborate, but Leslie, the nominee, would never actually see it. Um, I think it's Emery that we work with. Um, does quite a bit of research. So they actually have their internal team going to LinkedIn, they're doing web searches, and they're also putting together their own uh, notes that obviously didn't come in through the nomination. They're sticking into the note section. And so when the review committees come in to evaluate, they're taking the nomination form, Leslie's application, plus any additional notes that the Alumni Association thought would be beneficial. Um, and then they're including that in their selection. So again, um, really, really powerful stuff. I mentioned beforehand file uploads. So every single file that was ever uploaded, it could be video essays, it could be headshots, it could be references, whatever it might be, shows up in this list. And what you can do from here is physically press the view button and it'll embed that document right in the system. So you and your team and the review committee never has to download, export, and leave the system. Literally everything is centralized into one hub. The last thing I want to look at is what I call supplemental forms, but it's without a doubt the most impactful component of reviewer for your campaigns. And the reason why I say that is you might have Leslie who was nominated by four different people, plus she has a reference. So you basically will have a line item for every single nominee that nominated Leslie, as well as the references or whatever those other deliverables might be. And then when I press view, it'll actually show me the content that was submitted. So in this example, I have Ann Perkins who submitted these three question answer I mentioned beforehand, like what are the two to three things you want your references to talk about? Or this might be Ann's nomination about Leslie. Boom, it shows up right in front of me. So again, really powerful stuff going on here. Um, the next thing I want to show you here is kind of where we were talking about with the presentation, which is the review and selection process. So in this example, they actually took their nominations and broke them into phases. So they have an all submission bucket. They then take them and they assign it up to a team for internal review. They will then uh, narrow it down and move it to a selection committee. And then the selection committee will then review them and then narrow it down to the finalists. So the reason why this is extremely powerful is A, they have a bucket called all submissions because they want their team to be able to physically view all of them if they want to. Now, just because they can view all the nominations does not mean they're gonna review and score all of them. That is what the internal review and the selection committee buckets are for. So the way that this works is they fill up their buckets with all of their nominations, right? Logically makes sense. The next step is to assign that bucket out to a review team. So in this example, whenever Simon, Paul, and Mark come into reviewer, they're only going to see the submissions in their bucket. So if you have your own dedicated committees for internal review versus selection committee versus like your board's final selection, you can do that. Um, again, I want to go back to the randomization though. So under internal review, this is challenging because we might have, I'm going to make up a number, 200 nominations I have to get uh, reviewed by 15 people. Again, you can't ask one of your team members to review 200 nominations. So what we would instead do is we would open this bucket up and it will actually show you a list of every single nominee as well as 
excuse me, who your review committee is. Now, again, I don't have 200 in this example. I only have six, but it shows you a listing of every single nominee. It'll then show you how many people are currently in charge of reviewing it and then who those individuals are. So for the sake of uh, fairness and compliance and randomization, you could actually bulk select all of your nominees and say, I just want each person to get reviewed five times. No more, no less, exactly five. Or you could do that in conjunction with, I want my review team to review no more than 15, but no less than 10. So what you would do is you'd bulk select, and then you literally type those numbers into the system, and then it will equally and randomly distribute nominations to your team um, to make sure that those numbers match up. What you could also do is if you have like a conflict of interest or if somebody uh, drops out, you could then override this. And on a per person basis, you can actually control which um, nominations are being reviewed by which committee members. So again, we took a large number of nominations and we assigned it to a committee. We then took that committee and then bifurcated it down to randomization. And then now we're on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis controlling who can see what and when. So again, um, really uh, efficient ways for you to create not only workflows, um, but also ensure fairness and non-bias and compliance through these randomization tools. So then the last thing that we're going to talk about today is great. We took in all of our nominations. Um, we have nominations. Uh, we have the nominees. We've communicated with them. We've reviewed the information. We've sent it to our team. How do we actually conduct a selection process that does two things? Number one is it builds um, community uh, um, um, trust through a fair, non-biased selection. And number two is you're equipping your volunteers for success by being very um, uh, sensitive to the time that they have. Like, what is their workload capacity? So the way that I would structure this is a couple ways. Number one is I would actually redact any data that you don't want the review team to see. Um, if the question comes up, should this be redacted? I would err on the side of caution and say yes. So any personal identifying information, their name, their emails, their addresses, their demographic details, their ethnicity, all those things are irrelevant for the selection. You want your review team to review the content being submitted and the merit of the nominee, not who they are and what their background is. So in reviewer, you can redact all of that. Um, number two is that obviously there's going to be some type of deliberation or subjective kind of committee discussion around it, but I think we need to leverage data to help make informed decisions. So I would 100% incorporate some type of score sheet. And you can have different score sheets for the different phases of review. So you might have like an internal vetting score sheet, which is quite simple, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, phase two scoring might be really complex where you have like 10 or 15 different questions, each question's on a certain point scale. And then maybe your final selection is more so like rank this candidate, uh, are they in your top five, yes or no? The one thing I would do, however, though, is most of the scorecards that we see are mathematic based. And so it's asking the review committees to allocate points. And that's okay. The challenge is if you have like a one through 20 scale, um, what we found is that the judges get really bogged down. Like what's the difference between 16 and 17 or 17 and 18? So instead, try to elicit an emotional response from them. And what I mean by that is they're reviewing the content of the nomination form. Ask them questions such as like, um, from below average to great, rate this nominee's impact on the university, right? Making up examples. And so the review team is simply just answering the questions presented in front of them with like their initial gut instinct and emotion. They're not trying to figure out point scales. Now, behind the scenes, we absolutely will leverage a point scale, right? To help kind of build leaderboards, but the review committees themselves don't need to worry about that. Um, I am going to add one more note here before I show this to you, and that's how do you normalize results? And what I mean by that is um, what we have found is if you do a random distribution of nominations to your team, that typically implies, and it should imply, that not every nominee gets re reviewed by the same people. So what if you have some volunteers that on average just score higher or lower than others? How do you not penalize or reward a nominee that unfortunately got reviewed by one of those individuals? So let's take a look at that. So in Reviewer, um, I'm going to go ahead and log in as a judge. And you basically get this menu. And the review committees will obviously uh, not see demographic details or PI if you're redacting it. But they simply click on the name of the nominee or the ID number. 
and then it opens up a split screen. So half of the page is the nomination packet or whatever content from the packet you want them to see. And the other half is the selection tool. So this is gonna be kind of like the final selection committee scorecard that's being used in this example. Again, you could have a, a 10 question scorecard. Each question might have like a 10 point scale to it. There's many, many ways to structure that. It's completely custom. In this example, however, it's basically saying, hey, let's rank this nominee uh, on these kind of five different things, right? So um, are they, uh, do, do they not show characteristics of being a, a, a UGA alumni uh, award recipients versus are they a top dog? And what they'll do is they'll pick from a drop down kind of their score. And then behind the scenes, there is math that will kind of rank them for you. So um, again, the goal here is to create uh, efficiencies and lower the barrier. So your review committees can actually side by side, read through the application form. Again, if you have a scorecard that has like maybe five to 10 questions, try to structure it in a way that it flows with your nomination packets. And so they can kind of side by side, read through the nomination form. They can look at the file uploads. Um, they can leave comments and notes. They can look at all the nominations or all the references while again, side by side, leaving their comments and leaving their scores. And then what's going to happen is the system will kick out a leaderboard and it's actually going to show you a list right from high to low every single nominee the committee that scored them total scores averages all that type of stuff from here you can do a couple different things um you know ultimately you can go ahead and make your selections uh again you can kind of um uh, advance people to phase two phase three you can leverage this for deliberation meetings you can pull this up and use it to power discussions the name of the game is that we at reviewer don't make decisions for you we want to give you all the data to make however decisions you want the last thing i'm going to talk about here and i'm not going to show this too much and kind of do a little, quick little bonus is the normalization results so again, you can kind of see here for Sheldon, our nominee, that Mark scored it at 12. So my question then would come in as like, um, did, did Mark just not like Sheldon? It was it a low score or what if Mark has never given higher than a 15? So while that score is still quite low in comparison to the other judges, it's actually one of the best scores that Mark gave. So we actually have a report that will basically identify every single one of your judges uh, average scores and it'll basically show you if they're scoring way higher or way lower than others. And then what it does is it kind of normalizes it. So it, it basically changes the score. So say for example, uh, Mark's average score is a 15. Now it becomes a one, which means you were scored completely average. If Mark scores somebody higher than average, their score is like a 1.1. And then what you're gonna do is the system will then take each individual judge's averages and compare to one another. So your overarching winner might be like a 1.5, which means that that person scored 1.15 times higher than average, whereas Sheldon scored like a 0.98, which is just slightly below average. So again, um, these are things that you know we can kind of dive deeper into if you're interested in exploring that, but um, that's kind of the ins and outs of that. The last thing I want to show you is public showcase. So I think this is an emerging trend and you can do this uh, two different ways. So again, this is not the University of Georgia, just disclaimer, this is a, uh, an uh, association we work with and they do a 30 under 30. So it's a very similar concept award program. Again, trying to identify and retain and engage a younger demographic of membership. But what they do is they take the top 50 and they put them onto a public showcase page. So your community, your alumni, your, your students, they can go to this page and they can filter by the type of awards, whatever it might be, and they can see a listing of all the finalists. They can see a, a thumbnail or an image. They can see who they are. And then maybe like a high level abstract, right, or information about them. I've even seen some organizations do this year over year, and this is how they show their winners. What's cool about this though, is if you wanna take it a step further, you can do two things. You can actually open this up and it shows you that um, award nominees profile. So you can pick and choose what shows up there, but you could basically highlight the accomplishments of your alumni on the showcase page. And then to take it even further, what you could do is you could open up public voting. Um, it's kind of a polarizing discussion um, because you can uh, fraudulent vote, right? Like there's nothing that can prevent people from paying somebody on Fiverr or Upwork um, money to create accounts and vote. Um, but what's cool about this is that you can actually have people create an account and cast a vote, which means that the voters are now on your marketing list. Again, uh, it's all about kind of building up this giant marketing pool. They may be alumni that didn't get nominated that are now being put into your alumni pool for next year's program. So really powerful stuff. 
Um, there's ways to incorporate public voting. You could do like a fan favorite. You could you could weight it very, very low. Um, but again, I think I more so err on the side of showcase, less so on voting. Um, but I love the idea of taking all of your finalists or even all of your nominations and then publicly celebrating. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? Is celebrating your alumni. So with all that said, um, you know, the people who kind of attend these webinars are at very different stages. Again, I, I love what we do at Revere for a couple of reasons. Um, number one is that I've seen a lot of really great programs and a lot of industry trends and best practices and emerging trends. And so if there's ever a time that you want to kind of dive deeper into your awards or other types of programs, scholarships, board nominations, you name it. Um, and you want to kind of look at, you know, not only potentially how reviewer could power, but more so like um, what recommendations do we have based on what we see? Love to have those conversations. If you're more so, you know, been doing your program for many, many years, it's a well-oiled machine and you're looking to take it to the next level by using a tool like reviewer. Again, we'll love to have those conversations. So with that said, really appreciate everybody's time today. If there's ever anything I can do for you, please do let me know. Um, and again, I appreciate your time and your uh, participation today.